Okay, welcome back. We're going to start session two here. And and uh, and in the previous lecture, I talked about the, the, the origins of benefit cost analysis in the United States and its movement from rivers and harbors and, and the sort of physical waterway transportation improvements to the ultimate development of, of, of uh, a style and manner of decision making that, that, that sort of infuses government part of which are methods and procedures that align with benefit cost analysis and the kinds of analysis that is done to, to, um, to uh, justify government decision making. So, so we move along and, 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 uh, and we have a new era. Now, we had a couple of things happen and, and in, the, in the 1960s. Uh, early 1960s and in the early and then the later 1960s, and I don't have it up on the slide here. But we had President Johnson became president in 1963, and one of the great hallmarks of President Johnson's um, administration, and though it wasn't the Vietnam War, the great hallmarks of the President Johnson's administration was what was called the War on Poverty. And in the War on Poverty, um, there was also uh, a series of programs and enactments um, and the development of a set of public policies designed to deal with social issues here in the United States. Um, it was called the Great Society. And we got out of legislation in 1964 and 1965 a tremendous amount of programs and a reorientation of government involvement in society. We get, at that time, we get, um, we get the amendments to the, to the Social Security Act that provides health care assistance to poor people. Um, we get, the, we get uh, programs designed to assist housing and urban development and redevelopment in inner cities. We get um, uh, neighborhood level social services delivery programs. We get the most wonderful program, Head Start, to address early childhood education needs and opportunities for children that did not have those kinds of opportunities. And so during the early part of the 1960s, we get a tremendous amount of social program development. And those social programs are primarily being developed for the most needy people in the United States. Many of them are minorities. Many of them live in dilapidated situations and conditions in inner cities or, or in harsh conditions out in rural areas in Appalachia and on Indian reservations in the West. And, and in any number of, of places. And so, so now we've got a lot of government spending on social programs. And government spending on social programs, it becomes hard to quantify the benefits. Um, and you can figure out the cost because that's the budgetary outlay. But the benefits are something that are a little bit harder to quantify. Food and nutrition programs, neighborhood organizational programs, um, a young adult employment programs, workforce training programs, Manpower, Manpower Development and Training Act. Um, we have all kinds of things going on designed to, to make people more productive, um, more secure, raise their income levels, lower their nutritional deficiencies, minimize the health consequences of poverty and of crime and of social and, and deterioration. So we've got all kinds of things like this going on in our, in our economy. And, and government is changing rapidly and the things that government is doing are changing rapidly. And, um, and, and benefit cost analysis needed to change. But something really big happened. And, and in 1969, under President at that time Nixon, we get the National Environmental Protection Act, the EPA. And this radically altered our collective view of benefits and cost to society because previously benefits were, were monetized benefits that could be measured by gains to consumers or gains to producers or gains to shippers 
or or gains to truckers or or whatnot, but the gains were monetized kinds of gains based on being able to demonstrate that that incomes went up or the cost of production went down or the amount of destruction um, or the frequency of, of of catastrophe or safety improved to a certain level so that we had fewer accidents or disasters. All of these kinds of things were very, very important. But now with the EPA, we're starting to deal with, with other things. We're dealing with dirty water. What's the cost, what's the social um, de-benefit or the absence of a benefit, the negative benefit of bad water? What's the negative benefit, the harm, of bad air? What's the negative benefit of of an unhealthy workplace? What's the negative benefit of consumer products that aren't safe or as safe as they should be? What are the, what are the negative benefits of, of restricting or, or controlling the, the use of certain kinds of chemicals or pesticides or other kinds of things? Um, insofar as they influence the profitability of, of businesses. All of these things are all new different things that we had to, and, and then how do you weigh those against the gains to society? How much better off am I by drinking cleaner water or clean, breathing clearer air or working in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a situation, a factory or a foundry or or, or a warehouse or a grain mill that's safer. How much better off? What are my benefits? And, and so we've got to, we, everything's been turned to, to topsy-turvy. By 1973, um, we get policy standards and procedures in the formulation, evaluation, and review of, these guys have long titles, review of plans for use and development of water-related land resources. We're back to land resources but this is what's important about this. Um, we, we're still in that rational planning mode. Um, but they were to include benefit cost analysis in this. These were policies and standards that were passed. But no less importantly, environmental impact considerations were to be included in their analysis. And now for the first time, we are explicitly incorporating non-monetary factors in our benefit cost analysis. And those are factors that I just said are things that we don't measure very well, or we couldn't at the time, but that in making decisions, the public's um, not material well-being, but physical well-being now becomes a consideration. And so, so we get we get um, we get we get lots of ebbs and flows in terms of the rulemaking process, and and now we're bringing in non-monetary environmental considerations. Here, this is '73. We still have Nixon for a president at the time, and 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 we're we're bringing in and saying these things are important in determining whether we should be passing certain kinds of public laws or or enacting certain kinds of programs like the Occupational Safety and Health Act, for example, or any number of some of the environmentally related programs that had to be enacted. Remember, and we'll learn about this later on when we learn about externalities, the passage of the EPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, immediately, immediately raised the cost of doing business for businesses in, in the United States. It affected nearly everybody, and if it increased the cost of doing business, it also increased the cost of the goods and services that we bought. But we were supposedly getting tangible, intangible. We were supposedly getting returns to our well-being. Well, they don't, be they don't measure them very well, and so we, 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 we're, we have this thing. Now, this is where ideology kind of confounds us because we got all of this ev evolution of, of environmental regulation and, and, and a very positive and aggressive use of environmental laws during the Republican Nixon administration. Then we move up into the Carter administration. And now Carter, you may think, 
get started under Reagan, but it wasn't. Carter was the first great big deregulator. He thought government regulation was just a little bit too out of control, and he applied deregulation first to the transportation sector. But under Executive Order 12044 in 1978, he required that new regulations be subject to analysis and that the least burdensome of the acceptable alternatives be used. It did not, however, make explicit mention of benefit cost analysis, but now what they're saying, instead of the policy choice that produces the most benefits to society, remember back, those were what are to be chosen, now it's the least burdensome. And burdensome is a value-laden term. Burdensome upon who? Burdensome, of course, on business. Burdensome on commerce. Burdensome on the flow of goods and services across borders or across places. And so we're now starting to see sort of a broad um, uh, salt on, on benefit cost analysis and some of the expansion of government programming. In 1981, with a new era and a new president, we get a, these guys love their executive orders, Executive Order 12991, and it was much more explicit. And this is important. Regulatory action shall not be undertaken unless the potential benefits of the regulation. This is regulation now. This isn't programs. This isn't a dam. This is a regulation. You now have to prove that the benefits of the regulation outweigh the potential cost to society. So now what we've got is the, are the business interests fighting back against the environmental interests primarily. The rules and procedures for, ever, for either water or air or uh, solid waste treatment or workforce safety are being, are being assaulted, are being challenged that perhaps we went too far and now these rules are being pulled back. And accordingly and implicitly, this, this 1981 executive order, it, it rejected the multiple object consideration of environmental factors or something called distributional considerations, and that's fairness, um, as components of the calculation of net benefits. Um, uh, maximizing the aggregate net benefits to society. Um, it actually specified that the evaluation utilize a single evaluative, evaluative standard of maximizing the aggregate net benefits to society. You had to prove that your regulation was maximizing. You had to prove. Well, now we're back to maximizing benefits, and benefits are measured as tangible monetary benefits. And remember, Many of these workplace safety and environmental rules um, have to do with clean water and clean air and clean land and, and no dumping and, 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 uh, and workplace safety. And what's the value of that? How do you value that? Well, we didn't know. And we were just learning or we were just making it up or we were guessing. Well, it didn't cut the mustard and, and so it flew. So, the application and the underlying political and anti-regulatory agenda of that time, um, but the application of BCA um, to such issues um, came under intense criticism. And, and totally, they just, just about disappeared. The actual practice of benefit cost analysis with regard to anything that was regulatory and had something to do with environmental regulation and some of the broader categories of health promotion in the United States it just simply wasn't allowed. So benefit cost analysis went from something that didn't have very many rules, that rules were established, that it was routinized and regularized, and it was implemented quite straightforwardly across the board um, in many different types of government programs, especially for infrastructure kinds of programs. It slowly evolves into where it's starting to be used for social relief programs like welfare programs, but much more importantly, it's, it's applied quite rigorously um, in many areas to include non-monetary benefits in the justification of, of environmental and, and worker and, 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 and public health and safety well-being. And then that was assaulted because it, had, it, it was either perceived as being anti-growth 
anti-business, out of control, and constraining the, the United States' ability to compete nationally. If you think about it right now, um, we have something called the Kyoto Accords, and these were, these were passed in the latter parts of the, of the um, Clinton administration in, in the last part of the 1990s, 2000. And then the Bush administration basically rejected them and said, we don't. But the point was, many countries got together to say, we need to get together and limit our greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's bad for the environment, and we need to do something about that. And then immediately, we backpedaled away from that because we said, well, if we have to impose limits on ourselves, it's going to increase our costs, make us less competitive, and people are going to cheat in other countries. Well, it's the same kind of thinking here in the United States at the time. And that, that, that assault on regulation was something that we still live with today. But it was very, very powerful during the Reagan administration. And, and it truly, truly constrained benefit cost analysis, but it did something good for benefit cost analysis because it sent the scientists and the evaluators scrambling to develop good rules for conducting benefit cost analysis, and we'll get to that. So benefit cost analysis did and has suffered from a variety of ailments. As practiced, it's guilty of over time, vague, restrictive, if not contradictory, federal and state guidelines on its application. And they confound practitioners, people like me, and they confuse the public. And again, I said this is something that has rules, but as implemented in the public sector, too often we get ideology and we get particular kinds of points of views that either mandate that we behave in a certain way when we do this, or otherwise limits the applications of it. There are theoretical agreement, disagreements on its underlying economic justification. There are people out there that say that the tenets of welfare economics and the ideas of through government and intervention that you actually improve society's well-being are really not all that well justified. Um, I would argue viciously that that's not the case. But, you know, there are some economists out there who there's just no talking to, so I don't talk to them. And you shouldn't either. Um, that perhaps it's been used oftentimes in the absence of, uh, as, uh, that there really are, 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 there may be alternative evaluative mechanisms that we've over relied on benefit cost analysis and not been creative, and I don't mean creative as in skirting the rules, but creative in using our smarts and our talents and our computing power and our evaluative um, 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 history to develop alternative mechanisms. And an absence of institutions reviewing benefit cost analysis for appropriateness. This is important to me. This, this goes back to the thing that I was griping about in that lecture about the National Resource Conservation Service. Somebody should be looking at what they're doing and making sure that they're doing it right. And somebody should have oversight over, the, over the, 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 the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and making sure that they are doing right. And in fact, there is an agency that does it. It's a quasi-governmental agency. It's the National Academy of Sciences. And the National Academy of Sciences weighs in and defines the best practices. And it evaluates and reviews what some of these projects are doing. Um, but it does it somewhat on an ad hoc if not on a controversy-based basis. Either it's the sign of the times and they organize a team to go after something, or it's something that's controversial and, and there's just no resolving it without a group of scientists overseeing something. So we perhaps need more institution, uh, uh, an organization of standards and, and review to look at benefit cost analysis and appropriateness of applications. Most importantly, and this is where you and I come in, there are may, way too many incompetent applications, applications by those that are truly and grossly inexperienced, or applications that are skewed to maximize political or personal gain. Uh, personal gain. And I'm going to go back to the Corps of Engineers. There's a... I'm not going to describe it in detail here, but there's, there's been an ongoing controversy over the years 
um, on improving the locks and dams on the Illinois and the Mississippi River. There have been several benefit cost analyses that have been done by um, the Bureau of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. And those analyses, um, in one form or another, one way or another, they end up coming out with benefits that exceed the costs. But when those analyses are critically evaluated by academics, and I have a retired colleague who evaluated their work, or by the National Academy of Sciences, um, what we find is that indeed these analyses have been skewed, if not manipulated, or relied upon less than satisfactory assumptions about the future to get the desired benefits. And when the Neutral National Academy of Sciences reviewed these proposals, it came down and said, good God, you did it wrong, do it right. And for the most part, the Corps of Engineers took their their recommendations under advisement and did exactly what they wanted to do and darned if they didn't come up with another study that, that said the benefits still outweigh the costs. Well, they don't. They don't. Very many good people have looked at that. The benefits don't outweigh the costs. The scientists who are good at evaluating this have concluded that this is a boondoggle. And what did Congress do? Well, Congress passed initial funding for the improvement of the Illinois and the Mississippi River's locks and dams. And why did it do that? Because agricultural interests have a vested interest in those locks and dams being made as efficient as possible because it, it maximizes their return on their corn and their soybeans. And so you had Midwestern farm state interests who have a lot of power um, basically convincing their elected representatives that whether the benefits exceed the cost really don't matter. What we want you to do is subsidize this system because it's good for us locally. Well, that's the kind of political slash personal gain that, that happens in benefit cost analysis. The benefit cost analysis on the part of the Corps of Engineers uh, by, by nearly every reviewer that I have looked at has been highly critical. It didn't matter. It didn't stop them. They moved forward, and away we go with the, with, with the program. So still, it's important to remember that we're talking about government decision making, and benefit cost analysis is not private decision making. And so even though I complain about it, and I do it, and I say everybody else doesn't do it right, and that I'm virtuous and good and pure and clean, um, we're dealing with governments and government programs. We're dealing with providing good services, benefits to society. We're dealing with something a little bit more important than producing a Tickle Me Elmo. So accordingly, benefit cost analysis is concerned with trying to enhance the collective welfare, um, some of which cannot be expressed in monetary terms, but some of which can. So we can monetize some stuff and we can't. While benefit cost analysis must consider market values in determining the value of a benefit, it has much more than market values in its decision-making processes. Social values come into play. And we have, we have a variety of social values that we don't even try to quantify. We can't quantify fairness. We can't quantify justice. We can't quantify equality. And, but these are all kinds of things that governments try to maximize. And benefit cost analysis is merely one of many policy evaluation measures that government employs. Governments employ many kinds of decision-making criteria that may or may not be rational, in a market sense especially, but are rational from a government standpoint nonetheless. So benefit cost analysis is important, but to be fair, we have to deal with it. So let's... Let's go back over the timeline of benefit cost analysis. I'm just going to put this up here very quickly. In the early part of the last century, they dealt primarily with navigation. In the 1930s, we get the New Deal. And again, we're still dealing with physical infrastructure. It's either transportation, land reclamation, or flood control. Um, irrigation. Providing irrigation creates, I'll give you a great example, the government subsidizing or underwriting the providing of the ability to irrigate takes land that is not productive and makes it productive. It creates the opportunity for, 
for productivity in an area that didn't exist before. Um, so that was the 1930s. In the 1940s, we get the war years, and and we didn't get it, it, all of our public works were war related, and war trumped everything. Even if it was if it was dumb, it still trumped everything. Um, 1950s, we get the rapid expansion of state governments and local governments. The federal government is flush with cash. It's still spending a lot on physical infrastructure, but local governments and state governments now begin to invest heavily in streets and highways um, and, and, and community centers. And we get the beginnings of urban renewal, especially in housing, especially in some of our larger areas. During the 1960s, we get a widespread expansion of social programs. Um, we get income maintenance, nutrition, health care, and public health programs, community action, urban renewal, education programs, the many titles that are out there, but uh, Title I and, and also Head Start programs. Um, we also have defense programs during this time period and the Cold War. The 1970s, we have both labor and environmental well well-being that, that kicks in. More environmental initiatives, occupational safety and health, job training. Um, this is important. At the time, industry's ability to document the costs associated with compliance or non-compliance was limited. But at the same time, society's ability to document and quantify the benefits to be received other than they fit into the category of we ought to be doing this were also limited. In the 1980s, we get a deregulation period, and it's also appeared in the United States of widespread economic hardship. The current recession that we're in is in many ways matched or a match for the recession that we were in in the 19, early 1980s. And it's applied now to the effects of regulation, and government is, is scrutinized for the appropriateness of government intervention in the economy. And it becomes the basis for benefit cost study. So benefit cost analysis is stood on its head and used as a mechanism for invalidating certain kinds of regulations because you could not demonstrate that the regulations were maximizing aggregate net benefits. Um, and that, these were in the areas of product safety, occupational safety and health, workplace hazards, environmental impacts. Um, now, this is a period of time where industry's ability to document costs becomes much better, um, but also slowly society's ability to do document benefits. And so we start, to, we start to learn about the value of enhanced health. And so now we're coming, it's like a big battle, isn't it? Well, this is the stuff of, of this. Then in the 1990s, oh, we get Clinton and we have been reinvented government. And, and all kinds of things are going to be, we're going to rationalize government decision making. And in the process, process of rationalizing government decision making, we're going to embrace oh, private-public partnerships and, and, and much less use of benefit cost analysis and practice and principles. And I've got written here is much of what passes for evaluative research is simply a calculus apportioning sets of private market outcomes as a ratio against some mix of public spending. And then we get some sort of crazy, and I'm going to use a word, bastardization of benefit cost analysis, where all of a sudden people start talking about a return on investment or the amount of money the federal government was able to leverage and, and, and or classifying private economic activity as gross private economic activity against a set of public costs as a benefit cost ratio. And it was totally a complete subversion of the foundations of benefit cost analysis. And it's somewhat unfortunate because this happens at a time when we had generally bright people in government who knew better, but that they got caught up in this private public partnership um, um, lingo. And they all thought they were hip and cool and they were going to use financial language in the public sector when the, the irony of it is that anybody who knows anything about finances and returns on investments knows that the people using these phrases are nothing but idiots and clowns because they don't know what they're talking about. But they sounded smart and they convinced themselves that they were quite erudite and, and, and with it. So now we get the 2000s. We get an era of private sector dominance over public activity. This is what we've been living with up to recent. 
Many of the changes introduced over the last 20 years for evaluating the environment or the consequences of regulation have been further restricted and have increased the benefits burden of proof on government. We had during this decade, um, the, the decade of the 2000s, um, um, quite an assault on governments, quite an assault on regulatory processes, quite an assault on government oversight of health, safety, welfare, consumer product, and industrial activity. It's a continuation of what we saw a lot of during the Reagan administration. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself here. We get this, this return on investment language and this, this shift has seriously obscured, if not blurred seriously, the definition of a benefit in the classical sense into benefits from either a political or some other sense that really doesn't make sense. Well, now things have changed. We're in a period of very active governmental intervention. And the declaration of what's going on in the government during the 2009 recession and the subsequent activities of the government to deal with that recession, we're getting a lot of declarations that what we're getting is societal, some sort of societal enhancements. And, and so this time frame of what's been going on um, it's, it's now being written. We're, we're turning a different page. And I anticipate that with regard to benefit cost analysis, and I've seen it during the latter parts of the last couple of years, I've seen a reintroduction and a reinvigoration of very good benefit cost analysis. Some of this goes back not all that long ago to, for example, the, uh, the, the settlement associated with with cigarette smoke and tobacco use in the United States and in other areas of society, whether it's drug and alcohol abuse, um, health and welfare kinds of considerations, um, preventive medicine um, opportunities or, or things that the government might be trying to stimulate. And we're seeing much more creative and much more dynamic uses of benefit cost analysis principles and procedures in a, in a whole variety now of ways where there is emerging generally agreed upon um, a general agreement on that the costs are being measured or described properly and that the benefits um, indeed can be measured on a monetary basis over a period of time and that, that, the, that the returns to society, not the return on investment, the returns to society Everybody calls everything an investment nowadays. You know, do we do we invest in sewers? Do we invest in 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 policemen? Do we invest in in spaceships? It's it's silly. But anyway, the returns to society are are, are measurable. So we're we're moving now slowly into a period, I believe, where we're going to be required. And as a matter of fact, because government in the current period is much more active than it had been in the past. For a variety of reasons, we have a new president. We have a tremendous change in economic situation. Um, we've got, you know, it, it's just a whole new ball game. I think that there's going to be pressure on government to increase tremendously um, its ability to demonstrate the effectiveness of public programs. And one of the tools that are going, that's going to have to be used, is well reasoned, well defined, and well implemented benefit cost analysis. We've had a reintroduction of benefit cost analysis principles into several arenas and avenues of public policy. Um, I'm seeing it in many areas. I've seen, I'm seeing us use, use new approaches rather than try to go out and, and estimate the benefits of something. We, we, we do something called meta-analysis now where we look at a lot of peer-reviewed studies and, and try to aggregate and then average out the effects, understanding the low range versus the high range, and, and assume that a lot of earnest and sincere researchers covering this territory over the years has, has done a good job. They, they together have done a good job. So we do that now, and, and we're getting pretty good benefit cost analysis outcomes um, in, 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 in being applied to quite a lot of, of new areas. Now, that's the introduction, two sessions on the introduction to benefit cost analysis. And I'm not going to start this next section 
on welfare economics, this is this is this is uh, we'll start the basically second lecture, but it'll be on welfare economics. But remember, as I was talking before, welfare economics is is provides the underlying foundation, the rationale, the reasoning, and the and the foundations for justifying um, government activity, and and it's a way of thinking that I think it's perfectly perfectly suited to the way that we that we interact between our government and our private sector. Um, it's the way that I view um, government activity and the justification for government activity. Believe it or not, I hold the government up to very, very high standards before the government ought to be engaging in certain kinds of activity. And, and I want my government to be efficient, meaning it spends its money wisely and it's producing the most it can for every dollar that it spends, which makes me sound maybe I'm conservative. But I want my government to be involved in promoting as broadly as possible and as many areas as possible the maximization of justice and the minimization of, of, un, of, of, of unfairness. And, and so I also want my government to be doing those great big social things that make us all feel like part of a society. So I want my government to be good and effective and smart and not be wasting its money. And I want it to produce a lot of good things over here. And what I think are the good things over here are probably different than the things that you think are good things. And the problem or the, or the, the, the joy of American society is is that we get to choose the people that promote the good things for us. We call it politics. So we can never forget that this entire process is implicitly, is it's implicitly caught up and, and bound up in the political process at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And this entire history that I talked about, especially in the post-war period, uh, but, but going back to the... To the um, to the um, the depression and 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 all of the New Deal programs, we can see politics in, in in injecting itself and interfering with and having to be corrected all the way through this process. And so we can never forget the politics is part of the decision making process. And however rational we want to be, however smart and scientific I might think I am, and however um, able I am to point at principles on a page and say, follow the rules, darn it, it's still a political process run by humans, and there are going to be non-rigorous criteria that are used to make decisions. And boy, you've got to learn to accept that, or you'll go nuts in this business. Um, that's going to be the end of this second session. We'll start up on on this next lecture on welfare economics and we'll have to work our way through that because that's somewhat labored and 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 applied and uh, but I think I've got it broken down into the the kinds of of uh, principles that you're going to have no trouble understanding so look forward to seeing you next time and and I hope you've learned something bye